Good evening and welcome to the February membership meeting of the Cuyahoga County Progressive Caucus. My name is Steve Haleko. I'm the political director of the organization. And uh, before we get to our main program, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping for those of you who haven't been to one of our meetings recently. First of all, um, we're gonna stay with Zoom through the winter months um, for two reasons. One, we get out of town speakers more easily that way. And two, um, in case of bad weather, all you gotta do is turn your computer on. Looks like we're having a mild winter, but you never know. Um, but in the spring, we are planning to get back to live meetings. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that because we haven't had um, many live events the last few years. For those of you that are, are new to our Zoom meetings, one of the things that we do is as opposed to putting a bunch of links in the chat, uh, we will send you an email tomorrow that has all the links that we're gonna talk about during the meeting. Um, and, and that way you don't have to go back and forth on the chat, try to find the link that can be cumbersome sometimes. But what's gonna be in, included in that email um, is first of all, a link to join the Cuyahoga County Progressive Caucus. We sometimes get folks at our meetings who aren't members. Um, membership is free. If you join uh, our organization, uh, you can vote on our endorsements. You'll start getting our emails. My guess is if you're not a member and you're here tonight and you saw the agenda, that you will probably like what you see in the emails. Another link is going to be to donate to the Cuyahoga County Progressive Caucus. Um, we are all volunteer funded, all volunteer staffed. And um, if you have a little bit of extra cash and can donate, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Another link will be to the YouTube recording of this event. Um, we're gonna send the email out to folks who either registered or, or showed up. I guess if you showed up, you registered too. Um, but a lot of times people are interested in the event, they sign up and then they can't make it and they watch us on YouTube. We actually have found that we've had more people click the YouTube recording of our events than actually show up, which is a good thing. Um, and then there, there will be a link to our March membership meeting. Um, and in a minute, I'm gonna get to why that may not be the next time we meet. But our March membership meeting is uh, March 15th. Um, and the title of it is Brown's Dome Stadium, who pays? Uh, you may have read somewhere or seen news reports that uh, Jimmy Haslam is floating the idea of a possible $2 billion dome stadium for Deshaun Watson to play in. And so we're gonna take a deep dive into um, public funding for sports arenas. And we have a nationally renowned expert, Dr. Brad Humphreys from the University of West Virginia, uh, that's going to be with us uh, for that meeting. It was a saying, like, with Zoom, we can get out of town speakers a little bit more easier, but but we are going back to live um, in the spring. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce our first speakers, uh, Marissa Clark and uh, Marcella Gutierrez from the uh, One Fair Wage campaign. Hi, so I'm Marissa Clark. I'm the Ohio lead organizer and campaign manager with One Fair Wage. And Madi? Hi, everyone. My name is Madi, she, her pronouns. I'm the co-organizing director with One Fair Wage. Um, and I've also been a food service worker for over five years. And that's why I do this work, which uh, Marissa will tell you a little bit more about. All right. So One Fair Wage is an organization that is dedicated to improving working conditions and working for better wages for folks in the service industry. There are 280,000 members nationwide and there are 2,500 um, restaurants that are partners that are committed to better working conditions. So our bread and butter is more so the policy work and that's where we get to uplift wages and make sure to eliminate the sub-minimum wage. 
So right now in Ohio, the minimum wage is $10.10 and the sub-minimum wage is $5.05. And the goal that we have is we're going to be doing a petition to trigger a ballot initiative, basically to have it on the ballot for November, 2024 to eliminate the sub-minimum wage completely to bring it up to par with the minimum wage and also to bring the minimum wage up to be closer to the cost of living index so that people can sustain themselves without having to juggle which bills they're going to pay this month. The sub minimum wage actually has a history that's rooted in a legacy of slavery. So close to 160 years ago, when right around the time that the slaves were freed, restaurant owners were trying to figure out how to get away with continuing to not pay this newly freed workforce and created basically service sector sharecropping by deciding that instead of doing the tipping system the way that it had always been done, which was a wage with the tips on top, that they were going to give folks $0 as their wage and that they were completely reliant upon tips for survival. So fast forward to the New Deal and the sub-minimum wage went up to 25 cents, which only applied to white Americans. And then in the 90s, it then went up federally to $2.13 which is where it has basically been frozen in place at the federal level. And so in Ohio, we've had incremental change, but $5 really still isn't enough to do what needs to be done because people can't, it's very difficult to plan when you don't know what you're going to make. You know, it's not always guaranteed that a restaurant is going to be busy or that, you know, things are going to be consistent and not having a wage that you can rely on means that there are folks who go into shifts and they're basically working for free. And, you know, just still there. If it's a slow day, if it's a bad day, if anything happens, and it got even worse during the pandemic with people trying to make ends meet. It's also been, uh, oh gosh, sorry. I always get so upset about this part. Um, it's also basically contributed to the service industry having the highest rates of sexual harassment out of any industry. The majority of the people that work in the service industry are women of color. You know, people try to say, oh, it's just young folks, but generally it's folks that are over 25 and are just trying to sustain themselves and their families and their livelihoods. And it's 70% women of color. And it's been found that in the states where we have been able to get one fair wage legislation and also ballot initiatives, that the harassment rates have been greatly reduced and other workplace issues have been greatly reduced because people are able to more process what they're dealing with when they don't feel so reliant on tips and subminimum wages to survive. Mari? Thanks, Marissa. Um, yeah, just to add on to that, um, there are already seven states that have a regular wage plus tips. That's what we mean by one fair wage. Um, those seven states are Nevada, Montana, Minnesota, California, Washington, Oregon, Alaska. Um, and tips also remain the same or are higher in those states. So tips, it's like part of our culture. A lot of clients don't even realize that um, workers are getting sub-minimum wages, right? Um, so we're, we're, um, we're establishing that like the, like based on that experience, like that's what, what it's going to be in other states and what, um, has been proven. Um, also we are moving policy, like just on the national level, um, in 25 states, we recently won in DC, those, uh, workers are going from $4, um, to $16 and our initiatives, um, move progressively. So they don't move from one day to the other. Um, the policy that we're moving, oh, in some states we do legislation, and in some states we do ballot initiatives. In Ohio, we're doing a ballot initiative. 
And our policy, again, um, as Marissa has said, aims to um, eliminate the legacy of slavery that is the subminimum wage. There was a wage created by the government that was the minimum, and that is what folks need in order to survive. There shouldn't be a subminimum um, for folks, and also it affecting um, mostly women and then mostly women of color. Um, is still like a devaluation of our labor that we need to eliminate. Um, our initiative uh, in Ohio, um, we've already collected about 10,000 signatures and it um, is moving to get us closer to 15. So it's 15 for everyone, um, plus the cost of living moving after. Um, we're starting two years in advance. So what we wanna do differently with our initiative is that um, we are doing this in-house. Um, what we've seen um, with other um, progressive uh, ballots that are moving is that they hire um, they hire folks to do the work for them. And sometimes they're mercenaries, right? They'll just accept any work and sometimes on the same clipboard, they have um, issues that are harmful for workers while they are also advocating for workers on the same clipboard. And so what we wanna do is get our people that are actually affected by the issue on the front lines doing the work, um, advocating for their own um, for their own wages. So it's a we want to do power building and like organizing along the way. Um, of course, um, we're gonna we're gonna check in and, and make sure that we are reaching our metrics along the way, and that is something that we would consider moving forward. Um, going to a paid firm if like we're not reaching the metrics that we need to be reaching. But um, for now, we're starting early enough that we'll be able to um, do this with time. Um, yeah, I think that that covers my portion. I think Marissa covered the majority of it. Um, I don't know if folks uh, want, want to ask any questions or if that'll be added to the end. So if you want to ask a question, you can put the question in, your in the chat or, or use the raised hand feature and that's down at the bottom of your screen where the reactions, um, the reactions menu is just click on that and there's a raise hand. So if anybody wants to ask a question, you have two ways of doing it. Go ahead, Will. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. Really excited to, uh, to hear about this. Um, I wanted to ask about a New York Times article that was published last month. Um, that was really disturbing, um, and I was, uh, you know, just wanted to see if you guys could could explain kind of what that what that was about and what the follow up has has been. That was just very eye opening about um, you know it's like a mandatory class that's funding the industry. It was just very strange and disturbing. So, yeah, thanks. Totally, thank you, Will, for bringing that up. Um, for those of you who didn't read the article. Uh, the New York Times a couple weeks ago um, shed light. Um, we we helped with shedding that light um, that the National Restaurant Association, which is a huge trade lobby who has been responsible for keeping wages down, conditions down in the restaurant industry, um, actually created a training for food safety that it then um, passed legislation in four states, including California, which one is, which is one of the biggest restaurant industries. Um, to mandate this food safety training that would keep clients safe, right? So you think like it's it's something that's absolutely necessary, right? We, and it is necessary. However, they use the money that was generated from workers themselves who pay somewhere within a range of $8 to $15 for this training. And they have to pay, I paid it myself. I've also worked in the food service industry. So you have to pay it every three years. Um, and they use that money to then lobby against workers to keep wages down. They've used over $27 million for the past decade um, to uh, lobby against um, wages increasing. So part, a large part of why um, there is a subminimum wage still and the legacy of slavery still exists is because um, of the doing of the National Restaurant Association. They have um, a lot of ties with government. They have um, a lot of power and a lot of money that unfortunately was generated from, from workers themselves. And uh, what we're doing as a follow-up, um, we're, we're those four states that mandate this, um, in California in particular, uh, we're actually uh, working with Senator uh, Limon, who is pushing policy to make it so that it's actually the employers who pay for it, and they have um, different options. Um, there's already other options, but generally speaking, in the service industry, 
like I say this from my own experience, but also from what, what other workers are saying, you don't say I need my food safety training, you say, I need serve safe. And so it, it's almost like saying instead of saying, um, I need tissue, I need Kleenex, right. So it's almost like a, a household. So there's multiple components to it that are like marketing issues, but also um, right now having workers themselves pay for it is an issue. So in California, we're, we're moving legislation on that. And that bill was just introduced yesterday. Um, and we're also like yesterday as well, we had, um, we had a, a day of action in seven different states. Uh, hopefully I can remember all of them, but Illinois, California, uh, New York, um, Maryland, and a few others, we were actually gonna have one in Michigan as well, but there was, in, it was in Lansing and then there was a shooting. So we had to um, postpone that one. But um, yeah, we are having actions and workers are really outraged of this. So um, yeah, we're speaking up both passing things legislatively, but also um, having organizing, work, organizing workers towards events as well and taking it to the National Restaurant Association store. Mm -hmm. Will has another question. It will be a constitutional amendment to the state constitution. And then the concerns about legislation, Mari. Mari, you have no. to unmute. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, Sorry, could you, could you, um, what is GA? The General Assembly. Oh, did the possibility that would impact the outcome? Um, I'm not positive about that. Let me, could I circle back and ask my team? But yeah, there, yeah, I could ask um, Sara, who's our founder, and I'm sure that she's thought of this, but not something that I have thought of, I'm sorry. I can I can tell you from past experience, as long as it's a constitutional amendment, the legislature can't mess with it unless they go back to undo it through the same process. Okay. And and, and just to, to add to that, um, it, it almost has to be a constitutional amendment because it, those of you who were with us in 2016, you might remember we were working with SEIU 1199 to get the minimum wage in Cleveland. Um, but it, it, this was all set to go to, to be voted on by the citizens. Uh, then Cleveland City Council President Kevin Kelly talked to his Republican friends in Columbus and they passed a state law saying that no municipality can set a minimum wage that d different from what the state sets. So that kind of, the, I suppose you could do an initiative, a, a, a referendum and, and repeal that legislat le legislation but then they would just pass it again. So it, it, it has to be a constitutional amendment. Thank you, Steve and Deb for that insight. Yes, thank you. Also, Andrew um, was bringing things just up front of, of what um, his experience was in the restaurant industry. I'd love to connect with you, Andrew, if possible. So if you can pass me your contact info. I think that's it on the questions. Oh, wait. Nope. That's it okay. on questions. Are we done with questions, Deb? Okay, kind of piggybacking off this. Um, our next guest is Nora Kelly, who is going to talk about the state minimum wage as it is now uh, versus the Cleveland Fair Employment Labor Law. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to be really, really brief. Um, I have two important updates related to this. Um, before I get into um, the fair employment wage in Cleveland versus the state non-tipped minimum wage, and Marissa set this up perfectly. Uh, I, I promise we didn't plan this at our meeting last week, uh, but it's the, the perfect setup. I want to um, identify one really important thing for you all, and that is the Guardians for Fair Work campaign um, which um, CCPC is a coalition member of and a number of active CCPC members are helping to, to run. Um, successfully was able to get Cleveland City Council to pass a wage theft ordinance last December. And as part of that, um, uh, as part of that victory, um, a board that was um, established 20 years ago, the Fair Employment Wage Board, um, is gonna be resurrected, which is really exciting. And so 
it's a seven member board, two are labor folks, two are business folks, one community member, one member for, that the, uh, the mayoral administration appoints and one uh, representative from Cleveland City Council. So we are looking for recommendations to make about folks sitting on that board. You have to live in the city of Cleveland. That's one of the, the, the requirements. Um, but we're trying to do what we can, um, similar to what Clevelanders for Public Transit and some other organizations do, which is to put together a slate of recommendations so that we have really well-qualified folks that have the interest, the time and attention um, to really dig on these, dig in on these really critical issues. So if you guys are aware of any folks, um, probably not surprising to this group, we um, have come up with more labor and community folks, fewer progressive business owners. And so we're trying to, um, again, identify those folks um, so that we can make that recommendation of folks that are interested in sit sitting on that board. So I just wanted to put that in front of you all. Um, again, those are folks that do have to be residents of the city of Cleveland. Um, and I'm just gonna drop in, or Deb can drop in, um, because she knows I am terrible at multitasking and she's the, the tech master. And as I don't know if anyone knows in the paper, she was uh, also identified as the militant muter. So if you are if you get muted by her, um, you're not alone. Um, but she'll drop in the Guardians for Fair Work website um, so that folks can both sign up for the campaign uh, uh, um, emails, but more importantly, that you can identify if you're interested in helping to serve on that board or be part of the recommendations there. But again, the exciting part about the wage theft ordinance passing is not only that we will have wage theft protection against um, businesses that do that um, will no longer be able to do business with the city of Cleveland if they steal from their employees, which seems like a pretty um, basic thing. But this board is resurrected. The board was actually established in the year 2000 when Cleveland passed the fair employment wage law, which essentially tried to set a, li set a living wage for um employers that the city was doing business with right so it's a little bit more uh a little bit more circumspect in that it only covered uh employers um, that the city was doing business with um unfortunately in 2006 um it was the inflation index that was built in was removed right so over time this gets to marissa's point with the the wage at the state level that inflation index was removed and the purchasing power of what was once a decent uh, wage was sort of stripped over the years, right? And so what we want to do, what ended up happening because the state minimum wage sits um, is, is indexed for inflation, in January for the first time since 2000, the state non-tips minimum wage now exceeds Cleveland's fair employment wage law. And so what we're trying to do, um, and we will have more coming off the budget um, after the uh, city council makes their way through the budget, we're really gonna be pushing as a Guardians for Fair Work campaign to essentially go back to that original language in the year 2000, which included that inflation index, right? So I wanted to call that all out for you all. Um, we think that um, hopefully we're really successful with the one fair wage and we get an even higher wage um, that we can build on top of for the Cleveland fair employment wage. Um, but again, having all of these different conversations is critical about talking about the quality of jobs um, uh, in, our, in our city and in our county and in our state. Um, so I just wanted to flag that for you all. And there will be opportunities coming off the budget to sort of weigh in with folks on that. We're going to sort of gear up um, to try to fix that policy to, again, essentially restore the policy to what it was in 2000, which is including that inflation index, um, which was removed in 2006. Um, based on the number of contracts that the city has, it should not actually be that significant of a bu budget impact. So we feel um, more importantly than... Um, you know, it will impact a limited number of workers, but it's an important values proposition for the city to be clear about supporting uh, quality jobs um, in the city. So i um, happy to answer any questions that folks have, but just wanted to make sure that I flagged that as an issue because as we're seating this board, we want the board to have oversight over both the fair employment wage law and the wage theft policy. But if the state non tip minimum wage sits on top of that, um, on that wage, there's not a lot for the board to do on the wage side of things. So um, you can help us fix that a little later in the year and happy to answer any questions. Anything in the chat, Deb? Nope. Other questions? Okay. Um, Next segment, um, some updates on other constitutional amendments. And um, a little backdrop, um, as probably all of you here are aware, um, the nature of the Ohio General Assembly is such that 
constitutional amendment is the only way we're going to get legislation that's um, actually good and fair for the people. And actually, it's the only way we're going to get legislation that the majority of citizens uh, prefer. So uh, we heard from the One Fair Wage campaign, but others that are in the works, and 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 we don't know, you know, for sure, you know, when when everything is going to launch. But um, there's one to end qualified immunity uh, in Ohio. Qualified immunity basically protects uh, police officers against civil lawsuits, um, and and. and you know, of course, sometimes police officers need to be civilly su su sued in civil court. Um, so there's a constitutional amendment to get rid of that. Um, you may have read there's a constitutional amendment that uh, former Supreme Court Justice Maureen O'Connor supports um, to end gerrymandering by making it so that an independent commission uh, draws the maps as opposed to, you know, the very partisan uh, commission that you know we saw draw gerrymandered maps uh, last few years. Um, there may be another one to legalize marijuana. Now, that may actually not go to the constitutional amendment phase because the General Assembly, um, you know, may may pass that, and and the General Assembly actually has the option. They they could do this. It's not likely to happen, but. Um, when, when the One Fair Wage campaign submits their signatures, instead of putting it on the ballot, the General Assembly can just pass it. But, you know, that's not likely to happen. Um, but one of the bigger ones um, is the constitutional amendment that will protect abortion rights for women in Ohio. Now, here's what has happened so far. And then I'll tell you what we think happened today. So far, up until today, there have been two groups, um, one called Protect Choice Ohio, and the other one's called um, Ohioans for Reproductive Freedom. Now, Protect Choice Ohio is um, basically a group of Ohio physicians. Now, this group formed uh, last year, right after Roe was repealed, and they have been pretty aggressive in trying to get the constitutional amendment going this year. The other group, Ohioans for Reproductive Freedom, is composed of a coalition of organizations that have been around for a long time um, that you are probably familiar with. Planned Parenthood of Ohio, Pro-Choice of Ohio, ACLU of Ohio, and, and others, okay, but, but those are just the big ones. They have been studying the issue. Uh, one of the, the keys is ballot language, okay? Um, because we, you, you know how the Republicans are going to tear apart every little piece of whatever the ballot language is. Um, and so this requires a pretty precise study. And Ohioans for Reproductive Freedom, for a long time, weren't ready to commit to getting a constitutional amendment on the ballot in, in this year, in 2023. Those of you in the activist community know that it would be a disaster to have two separate constitutional amendments, that this has to be a combined effort, and it, it, even with a combined effort uh, with common messaging and everybody on the same page, it's going to be very, very difficult. But here's the good news. And we were on the phone on and off all day with our, our trusted sources in both organizations. They are very, very close to an agreement to work together this year to get a constitutional amendment passed this year. Um, we actually thought that they were working on a press release. Well, we know they were working on a press release that it was gonna go out late this afternoon and we could announce the combined effort at this meeting. But when we say they're very, very close, and when we say this is likely to happen, this is from trusted sources. But we're not going to say it's going to happen until it happens, um, until we see that press release that there's going to be a combined effort for a constitutional amendment this year. We are hopeful 
that press release comes early tomorrow or sometime tomorrow. If it comes early tomorrow, it'll be at the top of CCPC news and events. Um, if it comes later tomorrow, the, it will, we'll get you a separate email because what we have heard is um, they've agreed on the language. And, and again, this is what we've heard. Okay, so in, until we see the press release, nothing is definite. But we've heard that they've agreed on the language, that they are going to print petitions tomorrow, and that they're going to begin the signature gathering process this weekend. Now, the way it works, and this works for all constitutional amendments, you have to get a thousand initial signatures before you submit the ballot language to Frank LaRose um, for approval. And so, you know, time is of the essence because to get the amendment on the ballot in November, 400,000 valid signatures have to be submitted by the first week in July. Now to submit 400,000 valid signatures, you probably need 800,000 to a million because a high number of signatures gathered are invalid. So if you think of that, well, let's get 800,000 to a million signatures in March, April, May, and June. Huge effort. And what we understand is they're going to rely heavily on volunteers. And, um, you know, I, I don't think this is a hard sell for anybody in the Progressive Caucus. Heavily on volunteers, but also on paid, um, paid signature gatherers. Um, we, we like like I said, this is not definite, but it is probably a ninety nine percent certainty. Um, I mentioned our March meeting um, on March fifteenth on on the Browns Dome Stadium. If this gets all connected like we expect it to, um, we're going to do a special meeting uh, probably the first weekend in March because this is so important. Um, by then, you know, we'll have the plan on gathering signatures. Um, we do plan to work very closely with the Cuyahoga County Democratic Party because we now have friends in high places there. Um, we know they're going to be aggressive. So, like I said, um, it, 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 expect an email the next few days on this. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to have a special meeting on this early in March once it gets all connected. Questions? Our, our actual hope was if a combined effort had, had happened today that we would get a spokesman for the campaign tonight, but it didn't work out that way. So. No questions, Steve. Okay, our final segment tonight is, deals with a countywide care response pilot program. And I'm gonna let Josiah and Kevin do, do the, the detail explaining, but basically what that is, is um, we would prefer not to have police officers respond when professionals in whatever field is, is needed could do a much better job. Josiah, Kevin, am I correct on that? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, you guys are up. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and start. Um, and I'll kind of zoom out big picture and then we can kind of like narrow in um, on some specifics. Um, there have been a lot of these uh, programs piloted across the country. Um, some have been around for a really long time. Uh, the longest standing is, uh, I'm sure a few of you are aware of CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon. Um, there's one in Seattle and uh, Phoenix and Albuquerque um, in Denver. Um, but as uh, time has progressed, more and more cities have taken a look at this. Um, they're not without flaws. Uh, the, the one in New York has come under fire recently for kind of cherry picking cases. And um, there's a, a lot of times there's there's different tensions, right? There's a lot of large forces at, at work. Um, but we've also seen uh, more recently cities that reflect uh, more closely to the demographics and the kind of city that Cleveland is. Um, so Baltimore has recently um, got their program off the ground. And then even within the state, uh, Cincinnati started 
um, a little over six months ago with a really impressive program. Uh, Dayton has been running a smaller scope program and Columbus has been running kind of like a hodgepodge of things that it seems like now are going to be consolidated with some some recent developments there. Um, so we're likely to get a lot of data um, in the next six months that could be really, really helpful. And one thing that we've already learned from Cincinnati is the connectivity of their dispatch system uh, allows their program to work seamlessly with 988. Um, so they are passing calls back and forth between 988 and 911, um, both ways, not just one way, which is unfortunately usually the case. Um, and that is that was able to be facilitated so easily because they actually have a separate dispatch system, which is something that we do not have here. Um, our, we have a, a hodgepodge of dispatch systems here. Um, and in theory, uh, the county has um, authority um, or at least responsibility to make sure that everyone within the county has emergency access um, to those systems. Uh, but those dispatch systems operate independently. Um, some of them are conglomerations due to cost savings. Some municipalities run them themselves. Uh, so from that perspective, Cleveland is at like a disadvantage. Uh, Cuyahoga County is at a disadvantage. Um, there are specific places where a single municipality does operate their own uh, dispatch, which make those light, likely pilot candidates. So we have places like Lakewood, um, places like Cleveland, um, I believe, I want to say Garfield. There's a couple other places. Um, but the idea is that when we think about things largely uh, across across a county, uh, we're able to up um, up the service area, right, and spread the care around and utilize all of the systems and make the biggest impact, as well as keep cohesion. Um, so there's kind of standards of operation, and you don't have a million different things happening and people not understanding and how are we getting these billables? So that leads us back to Medicaid. Um, and one of the big things that we've kind of found out is, is from a funding perspective, if we can get dollars um, per like citizen rather than billable dollars, that allows a lot of freedom for uh, program development um, because everyone doesn't have to be able to have billable hours, right? So um, some of those uh, stringent uh, licensures and things like that um, are not necessary uh, within more pieces of your program. I think locally, something that recently happened, and then I'll pass it to Kev um, so he can talk about some of the stuff that Surge has been doing. And I didn't even really introduce myself. Um, my name is Josiah. I work, uh, I'm the director of uh, organizing and advocacy at uh, NEAC, Northeast Ohio Coalition for the Homeless. Um, and there's a lot of intersectionality in, in that work. Um, and I'm also privileged to um, work with Elaine, who I see on the call um, at REACH advocating for this um, in the in this county and in the city and wherever we can. Um, but uh, within the city of Cleveland, there's been um, some interesting developments. So at the Adams Board, um, which many of you know, basically controls all the mental health um, and addiction dollars kind of that come in. Um, and that's largely at the, um, you know, through the county, that's where a lot of those dollars come in. Um, but a lot of the infrastructures are within the city. And so the city has recently um, said that they wanted to pursue this, they attached it on to a uh, amendment, um, a lot allocating some ARPA dollars um, and originally it was just co-response, but they kind of tagged in some language um, that enabled the, the door to be cracked for care response. So that's interesting. And um, the public health department had uh, Dave Margolius and uh, as well as Sonia Pryor Jones within the city has shown some interest in this. Uh, and there's supposed to be a strategic person being hired that just went out like last week. 
um, which is great to have someone within the administration that's specifically kind of like tasked to this. Um, and I know that we're speaking countywide, um, but any kind, the county is geographically too large and will require too much to all happen at once. So it has to happen somewhere first. So we're keeping an eye on where, where that likelihood could be. And the most impactful place would be Cleveland. Um, so any developments there, we're definitely keeping our eyes on. Um, and the, the mayor did just come out the other day and, and really stress about how uh, much of a challenge it has been to be hiring police officers. And they're, they're trying to do everything with recruitment videos and enticing people with pay, and they're just bleeding officers. And um, the language, I had not heard the kind of language that I, I heard specifically um, connecting the dots of like, hey, we should try to um, spend some money in some different places. And uh, I thought that was really encouraging, um, you know, baby steps. But um, I think those things are all really interesting from kind of like a top down level moving uh, nationwide to really specifically to Cleveland. And I'll pass over um, to Kev so we can talk about some of the stuff that uh, Serge has been doing um, with their canvassing. I don't think he's back. Oh, he said he would turn his camera on when he when he came back. Oh, no, there he is. Okay. Nope. Yep. I'm back. I was just patiently waiting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josiah. Uh, my name is Kevin Ballou. I am, uh, I am an organizer with Surge, showing up for racial justice. Uh, also <clears throat> a part of the um, Cuyahoga County Jail Coalition and just have been doing organizing work here in Cleveland for some years now. Um, so with Surge, uh, I guess we rolled off the Issue 24 campaign. Um, you know, we're an organization that focuses on community organizing. Um, you know, of course, we work with advocacy organizations and others, uh, but our focus is organizing people. Um, and rolling off the issue 24 campaign, you know, we jumped into the REACH Coalition for care response, for a care response model. Uh, and with that, you know, we have been doing canvassing work in Old Brooklyn. Uh, over the summertime, we were door knocking. We, uh, and we've been doing a lot of signature collection uh, as well. Um, and we have, maybe around 600 signatures. Uh, we also have a online petition. Um, if any of you would like to sign and just circulate that, you know, our thing is making sure, um, is building people power. And, um, we, uh, yeah, so we've been, we've been focused a lot on that. One thing that we did just create is a template also, um, uh, letter that we've been sending to city council members. So for those of you that do live in the city of Cleveland, I will happily send you that uh, template if you would like to send that to your city council person um, advocating for a care response. You know, and, and as Josiah mentioned, you know, uh, we have studied this and studied uh, the CAHOOTS model that they have in Oregon um, and studied uh, different models they've done in Durham, North Carolina, um, and Albuquerque, New Mexico, and, you know, goes to show that a full care response model um, just does much better, even than a co-response model, um, you know, and that will give more time for, and, and an open space for the police to do uh, more police work ending violent crimes, you know, uh, so instead of uh, wasting energy and resources on, you know, thing on mental health issues, on people struggling with addiction, you know, where we can have a um, mental health professional or somebody trained in de-escalation tactics handle those issues. Um, so that is, you know, we've just been trying to still bring people into, uh, the care response um, model and to, into fully understanding that and why it would be better as a city to implement. 
Um, so if you would like to sign the petition or, um, uh, you know, send that letter to your city council person in Cleveland, please let me know and I can send that over. Um, uh, and thank you. I, I guess I'll pass it. Uh, if I didn't cover anything, Josiah, feel free to cover something, but, um, yeah, that's what we had Surge have been focused on. Yeah, so I mean, I think um you kind of forget to mention, yeah, you kind of forget to got to mention the whole Ronane Town Hall, which was so awesomely uh helped to be set up by um Surge, uh, which took place in one of the newer PSH buildings over on the west side. Um and that was awesome. Uh they they unveiled this giant like um scroll that had all the names that they had collected signatures um and Ronan um committed to attempt to roll out a care response model um so you know he was on record saying that um it was explained to him a couple times to make sure he, he got exactly what it was and I do feel remiss to to that I haven't really explained exactly what it is we're talking about we're talking we're advocating for something without really explaining it and um it, the idea is that um there are a lot of calls that don't need police involvement. Um, uh, a lot of mental health calls, um, a lot of like, hey, open container calls, a lot of like loitering, um, uh, quote unquote, trespassing calls um, on, a, on a lot of unhoused folks. Um, you know, even kind of like wellness check situations, this guy doesn't look so, so hot, like whatever, that may honestly just be a medical thing, like somebody just may have low blood sugar. Right. Um, somebody just, um, you know, might need a ride somewhere. Uh, so there's lots of like little things. They might just really be dehydrated um, and they could even present like a mental health crisis. Um, and so a lot of times we criminalize so many different spaces and we say, oh, we need more. We need more police when what we need is to figure out more institutions of care. And so care response is about creating institutions of care that are community based, um, incorporating peers in that response, um, folks with lived experience, um, people who know the neighborhoods um, and accounting for that lived experience um, as valued and worthwhile. Um, and it can take, you know, it can be very professionalized or less so, um, but generally has a crisis worker of some sort. Um, that is kind of used to being in kind of crisis situations um, and someone with usually a mental health or behavioral behavioral health uh, background um, of some sort. Uh, they're not, you know, doing surgery out there, right? That's not it. Um, so we don't need doctors in the field. There are things to consider like medical holds and um, mental health holds. And, you know, those are considerations um, but the care response model is is not to run around and um, what is colloquially called pink slip everybody. Um, what what they bring to the table is the ability to spend the time that's that's needed and have the expertise um, and the want to. Uh, and a lot of situations can then be like smoothed out and caught, it it saves um, taxpayers a lot of money. It saves municipalities a lot of money. And there have not been a lot of problems um, as far as injuries, uh, no deaths that I'm aware of in any of these programs. Um, and we know that people suffering from mental health die at five times the rate of others when interacting with police. Um, and so what we can do to mitigate those deaths, as well as just the trauma that is non-lethal um, that people carry and then makes them actually more likely to experience it again, uh, the further upstream we can push these resources and um, uh, institutions, the better. And so that's what Care Response tries to do and integ in integrate um, itself into existing community um, uh, institutions of care. Uh, so be that hospitals and schools and all the sorts of resources that communities need, uh, mentorships programs, whatever. Um, and I don't want to forget the youth component is is really important um, because a lot of times our, our our youth are being traumatized and funneled straight into the prison uh, school to prison pipeline, um, and a lot of it is just you know trauma and mental health issues, um, and you know poor diet and poverty, um, 
And so to meet to meet that with um, with care rather than handcuffs and sirens and guns and badges um, is something that is just a really powerful way to look at the at the issues in front of us. And so that's why we think care response is so important. And I'll stop talking and leave time for questions. Go ahead, Will. Thanks, Josiah. Um, and it's good to uh, to see you. I'm sorry, I'm eating dinner, so that's why my video is off. <laughs> um, so a quick question. I um, saw that the Cleveland Police Commission has started to meet. Um, and I was wondering um, what role will they play in the determinations of a co-response model uh, to a care response model? Is that ultimately their decision or is it someone else um, in the city? Thanks. Um, so yeah, I think, um, great question. And one of the things that I, and myself and Elaine and many other people who have been in this space have been kind of wrestling with for a long time was like, uh, until the police commission was even instituted was this entity of like MRAC and this consent decree. And it's like, it's specifically around the police. It's, it's, it's actually, you know, an agreement between the city and the DOJ, um, but within those spaces, it was very much like, you know, the police is on every little board. They run the co-chairs of every room. It doesn't happen without them, right? And um, so recently, the Adams Board has stepped back from hosting that, and that's now being hosted by the city. Um, so there is at least more closely some ownership and accountability, at least because it's, it's attached to the city. And hopefully um, the police commission um, also can play a role in this. Um, they're certainly able to make recommendations um, and should certainly have purview over co-response in some way. Um, and I also think it is within their purview as well as as well as MRAC, and I have always believed that is, is to make a recommendation that if something is not suitable um, for police to be carrying out on a regular basis, like this should be taken out of you know their purview. Um, you know, obviously, like you can't know everything before you go to a to you know to any place or anything. You know, the dispatch does their best job to kind of assess the situation. Um, and in most cases, it's you know, most of the time it's really not, you know, that big of a deal. It's just it's just not like most police work is really boring. Um, but when it's a when it's a moment that is, we need to be smart. And uh, so one thing about care response is important is that we really want to really have it separated from the police, right? Um, from an information gathering standpoint, you wanna know as much as you can, um, but the places that we send care responders, we don't wanna be sending police. And the places where we send police, we don't wanna be sending care responders. Like uh, until that is like, you know, after the fact, you know, on a follow up, sure. Um, so there needs to be a clear delineation, but I think the CPC definitely can, should have a role with the co-responders, like flat out. Um, I think both that space as well as MRAC should be able to have a voice to say, this is what we think should be happening. And this, and this shouldn't, the police shouldn't be doing this. They should be doing other things. Go ahead, Nina, but you have to unmute. Hi, uh, <clears throat> Josiah, does um, Cleveland have their own uh, 911 dispatch as a city? Did you say yeah. that? Yes, they do. They run their own dispatch. Okay. And that and that is within, and this is another thing, that is within the, um, the, the CPPA. Um, so dispatch falls under the police in Cleveland, um, which is not helpful. <laughs> and I'll just let it go. Okay. 
Any other questions? I don't see any, Steve. Well, oh, I, I, I wanted to say um, for for uh, Kevin's uh, letter thing, you know, I wouldn't discourage people from sending it to your um, city council, even if you don't live in, in Cleveland. I'm sure you can change the wording around just touch and let them know that they should have care response there, too. Um, so I know I know some folks worked on uh, on a shaker campaign um, with me and we, we still got some we still got some work to do over there. Um, and that's been very apparent. But um, yeah, don't you know, as long as you live in the county, I guess if you live outside the county, then I don't know, you can do it just to have fun. But I don't know how helpful that is. <laughs> Anything else? Well, let's give our speakers a big round of applause. We're, we're not live, so we can't stand up and do it. So either click the thing in the chat or go like this. And um, thank you all for coming. Um, and like I said, stay tuned um, to our emails about the uh, constitutional amendment to protect a woman's right to choose. And um, we will see you all soon and hopefully soon live. Good night.